whenever I give talks or presentations at historical events, one of the questions that I am always asked is, how many gowns did an 18th century woman own? Now, as a historian, my natural answer is, well, it's complicated. Just as we don't all own the same number of clothes today, neither did people in the 18th century. How many garments we own depends on our income, the space that we have to store things, whether we have inherited or been gifted things, and our ethical, or not so ethical, approaches to clothing, care and sustainability. Maybe you can help demonstrate this by letting me know in the comments if you could estimate how many garments you own. And maybe if you do this, you'll be helping historians of the future because people in the past very rarely made convenient lists of everything that they owned. Documents like inventories, for example, tend to happen at specific points in life, like death. And garments were more frequently mended and remade or passed on to relatives or servants. And that just doesn't appear in the standard methods that historians have for accessing consumption or shopping for dress. And those are documents like accounts, receipts and bills. So the information that we have is rather limited. And that is why dress historians absolutely adore one 18th century woman called Barbara Johnson. And I really love her because I wrote a whole chapter in my book, Material Lives, about her. She's a special lady. Johnson, very conveniently for us, chronicled her consumption of dress from the age of eight until well into her 80s. So that's over 70 years of fashion shopping. Even better, her mode of recording was an incredible album in which she pinned samples of fabrics from all of the gowns that she had made for her, from childhood through to adulthood and into old age. And there are over 120 of them. There are brocaded silks, printed cottons, trims and fringing and beautiful embroidery. It's really quite breathtaking. Now, the original album is in the V&A and is quite delicate, so the museum has digitised quite a lot of it, and I've put a link in the description box for you to peruse it at your leisure. And if you're really lucky, you can get your hands on a facsimile copy that the museum produced in the 1980s. They're uh, quite pricey, and I was very lucky to find a copy in my local second-hand bookshop when I was an undergraduate student 15 years ago. Eek. But this amazing record tells us so much about one genteel woman's wardrobe, her relationship with her clothing, and kind of answers the question about how many gowns an 18th century woman owned, just in a roundabout way. But we'll get there by the end of the video. Okay, so let's put this album in context. Who was Barbara Johnson? It's really important to remember that there's great disparity socially, culturally, economically in the 18th century and no two women's wardrobes were the same. So Barbara Johnson was born on the 17th of May, 1738 in the beautiful sleepy village of Olney in Buckinghamshire. She was the eldest and only daughter of the Reverend Wolsey Johnson who was a bit of a career churchman, collecting up parishes and taking their income. His portfolio of positions meant that he generated a significant income and the family owned a London house in Hoban and towards the end of Wolsey Johnson's life, he built a manor house at Witham on the Hill. But Barbara Johnson grew up living in the great house at Olney which was a rather imposing Jacobean property that had been in the Johnson family for generations. So we aren't talking about dukes and earls going to court, but we are talking about local assemblies and dinners with gentry families. Very Jane Austen, just 50 years earlier. <laughs> 
And actually, Johnson is tangentially related to Jane Austen, but it's very distant and complicated. There are no surviving portraits of Johnson, just a really tantalising mention of one existing in a family letter. So the only description that we have of her comes from her mother when she was a child, and it's rather charming. Her mother said, quote, She is extremely fair. Her cheeks look as though they are covered with rose leaves, and her lips are like the coral she wears. Her papa and mama think her the very finest child they ever saw with their eyes. Now, whether by choice or circumstance, like around a third of the women in the early modern period, Barbara Johnson remained single for the rest of her life. So, why did Johnson decide to make this album? Albums like this are certainly not unheard of, but neither are they incredibly common. And it's especially remarkable that she kept the album going for over 70 years. But for Johnson, I think the answer is essentially money. In fact, there's a wonderful print that Johnson herself stuck in the album like an epigraph, which reads, and I quote, well, regulate your cash to trade attend. Mark from receipts and payments what you spend. Pay every debt, exact each just demand. So shall fair fortune wait upon your hand. Now, most of the entries in the album include the price per yard of the fabric, as well as how much was purchased. So in many ways, I think this is a form of account book but it accounted both for Barbara Johnson's finances and her life story, holding little material memories within each fragment of a garment. In her will, Jane Johnson left her daughter and each of her younger sons £1,500. Now this is about the equivalent of £175,000 today in terms of spending power. When one of her brothers left her a further sum later in her life, she wrote to another brother that, quote, I have always learned to be content with a slender income and have gone very well through the world to an advanced age. I have, I believe, met with as much real friendship, affection and esteem, the true blessings of life, as if I had possessed a much larger fortune. I have always kept myself independent and I have all the comforts of life. I am not likely to grow rapacious in my old age." But when eight-year-old Barbara Johnson sat down with her mother to begin this project, surely money was not on that little eight-year-old girl's mind. So let's look back at that first entry. Barbara Johnson took a snippet of the fabric left over from her first full-length sack gown pinned the small rectangle of fabric, measuring four by eight inches, to a slip of paper, and upon the paper she wrote in a neat hand, a flowered calico long sack, 1746. To me, this is very much part of little Barbara Johnson's education in self-regulation and accounting for her place within the world. And these were really key concerns for 18th century educators. And this makes a lot of sense when we learn a bit more about Barbara Johnson's mother, Jane. So like her daughter, Jane Johnson left a prolific record, but hers was of children's education. In the archives of the Lilly Library in Indiana, there are 438 examples of the educational materials that she made for her children as well as the manuscript for her children's book, A Very Pretty Story to Tell Children, which was the first fairy tale written in English. So they're a pretty impressive mother-daughter duo. Some of Jane Johnson's little educational cards are meant to teach her daughter specifically about dress and the social situations that different garments were worn for. Card number four of the series, for example, depicts, quote, 
Miss Carpenter, in a yellow lustring sack and a red knot, dancing a rigadoon by herself at Mr Lally's school. Other images depict, quote, Miss Cherry Lily, dressed in a blue satin coat, walking with a fan in her hand to church. And, quote, Lady Margaret Mordaunt, daughter of the Earl of Peterborough, in a red lustring coat. Another, rather charmingly, depicts Barbara Johnson herself. So, begun at her mother's knee at eight years old as part of this educational strategy, the album served Barbara Johnson well. And she spent the rest of her life keeping it up. She adapted the process, adding fashion plates and sometimes even details of the events to which gowns were worn. And through the album, she wove together a really rich tapestry of what her sartorial life was like. Johnson's notes in the album reveal that she was very materially literate. In other words, she understood textiles, fashionable dress and its vocabularies. Those educational tools created by Jane Johnson had specifically used terminology such as lustring rather than simply the basic fibre, silk, and Johnson continued to update and refine and use this terminology throughout the album. But the album does also reflect some of the bigger changes happening in textile history. Throughout the final decades of the 18th century, silk satins and brocades gave way to purchases of cottons in the form of calico, muslin and chintz. This coincides with the domestic cotton industry booming as factories and mills started to pepper the British landscape and this cheaper novel fabric enjoyed a burst of popularity amongst consumers. Okay, so how many gowns did Barbara Johnson really have? I am so, so sorry but I'm going to have to do some maths and show you a graph. It's like I'm an economic historian. I'm going to need to spend some time with some gowns to get over this. So there are over 120 samples in the album. So 120 gowns, right? No, because we know that there are at least some gaps. Some of these gaps are single years, so maybe she just genuinely didn't buy anything that year. But other larger gaps, such as 1773 to 75 and 1783 to 84, coincide with periods when we know that Johnson was socially active in Bath and was highly likely to have needed new gowns. Would you have us laughed out of Bath? We also know that Johnson received or inherited items of clothing which do not appear in the album. So why weren't these recorded? Well, it's probably the nature of the album. Johnson only recorded when a new fabric entered her possession and was the very first iteration of a gown that it was made into. So it was perfectly normal to refashion and remake old gowns. It was the fabric that held the worth, not the labour of the making. And Johnson wouldn't be recording that. So if it's not an acquisition of fabric, if it's just maintenance and upkeep or inherited garments, they, they literally couldn't be recorded unless she took a pair of scissors and took a big chunk out of them. So the album captured initial moments of garment construction, but not the afterlives and remaking of those garments. So with that in mind, the graph. So the red line is the number of garments recorded in each decade, and the blue line is the gifts of fabric, which are usually from Barbara Johnson's brothers. So it's really clear that through Johnson's teens and twenties, she is accumulating her wardrobe in, in fabric form. She's building it up from scratch, purchasing fabric for two to three gowns per year. But by the time she reaches her thirties, that need wanes. She has a lot of fabric made up into a variety of gowns. As fashions changed, 
She simply had those garments remade and altered. Some of those gowns from the 1750s might have found new life in a new style 30 years later, while others might have been worn out, passed on or gifted. But there was still a little trickle of new gowns. By her 70s, Johnson was still buying herself a new gown most years. So, we know that she had at least 120 gowns over her lifetime, but not all at once. Now, that sort of sounds like an incredible amount, especially when we think about how many garments from the period do survive. How many have been lost if one middling genteel woman had 120? But actually, think about how many garments you have and have had. The garments that you've discarded, sold or given to charity, I bet it is actually more than 120, especially if you've lived into your 80s. Barbara Johnson was one of the four women that I wrote about in Material Lives, my book which was published by Bloomsbury back in 2021. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more about some of the other women that I wrote about and I'll put a link so you can get a copy of the book as well. Remember to like and subscribe if you want to hear more about fashion in the past. <laughs>